Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to you. Welcome back to those who are here this morning and welcome to some visitors who are here tonight with us. It's an absolute joy to see you in the house of God. And some youngsters, the youngest in the whole church is in here too. So she must have enjoyed church this morning as well. Thank you very much. Well, clocks change, times change. And we're going to begin with the hymn which speaks of that. But first of all, just a little reflection from Psalm 31, verses 14 to 15, which says this. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. And then a short piece of Spurgeon's commentary on that. The great truth is this. All that concerns the believer is in the hands of the Almighty God. My times, these change and shift, but they change only in accordance with unchanging love. And they shift only according to the purpose of one with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. My times, that is to say my ups and my downs, my health and my sickness, my poverty and my wealth, all those are in the hand of the Lord who arranges and appoints according to his holy will the length of my days and the darkness of my nights. Storms and calms vary the seasons at the divine appointment, whether times are reviving or depressing remains with him, who is Lord both of time and of eternity. And we are glad it is so. I trust you can say amen that we are glad that it is so. Our times, the days of our life, are coming, are passing, are all in God's hands. And so we bless his name for that. And we'll begin with that uh, hymn, um, The Sands of Time Are Sinking, number 581. <laughs>
Now Kenny will lead us in prayer. Thank you, Kenny. Just use the microphone. If I have a favourite hymn, that hymn that we sang would be one of them. And Anne Ro Ross Cousins wrote that many, many years ago. And you might not know, there's over 30 <coughs> verses in the words that she penned. The sands of time are sinking. We bow before him. But before we do that, I would like to read God's word. The only rule to direct us. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the water, and you will have no and, and you who have no money, come buy eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. We spend our money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good. <coughs> the marvelous message of the gospel that we've already heard this morning. Follow the crowd or stand out and truly surrender to the Lordship of Christ. It doesn't cost anything, as the scripture tells us, but it demands everything. So let us bow before him. We pray, Lord, as we gather here this night, we pray for the aid of your spirit and fill our hearts with a sense of your presence that we might be transformed and renewed and filled by your spirit. We acknowledge before us that our sins, which are many, but his mercy is more. And as Anne Cousin said, I rest along towards heaven against storm, against the wind, and against the tide. And anyone who is faithful to the Lord will know the truth of these words. As we wrestle on against all the difficulties, we thank thee that we stood out from the crowd and that, that we were not ashamed to own our Lord. They looked to him and lightened were, and they weren't ashamed to stand on the Lord's side. And we pray for all gathered here this night, that we would be prepared to cast in our lot with God's people, and that we would stand out from the crowd. Lord, we thank thee for the clear, crisp message of the gospel that went forth this day, and help us, Lord, to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to humble ourselves before him, and to seek his face, and turn away from all that distracts and all that would take us down the wrong road and help us to surrender to the Lord Jesus tonight again. We worship thee, Lord, and we would pray for forgiveness for all our failures and for all our sins and for all our shortcomings. We acknowledge our great need at this time as a church, as a people, as a country, as we think of Scotland and as we think of Britain, we pray in Jesus' name that the forces of evil would be kept at bay and that we would see a turning from our wicked ways and that we would surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Bless this gathering, we pray thee. And may the gospel in all its fullness be proclaimed in every city, in every town, in every village, in every glen, up and down our islands and in these islands that we love. We would pray again from 
the blood to bara and we pray that you would again revive and speak and quicken us O Lord we remember we pray thee what is taking place in Scotland over these days and we pray again that your name might be honoured and that your purposes would be worked out we would humbly pray that your will would be done and that the gospel would again have free course in this land of Scotland we think of the words of John Knox who prayed give me Scotland or I die oh for leaders to pray that prayer at this crucial time in our beloved land help us Lord to be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord not following the crowd but be true to ourselves because time is indeed short and thou art speaking to us so often but how we give thanks for this opportunity to come to worship this night and we know we will never regret time spent in God's house and time spent in worship bless your servant over us strengthen him and help him in all that he seeks to do and we pray for every head bowed before thee and we pray for these young lives and we thank thee as they've been mentioned already that they would remember the creator in the days of their youth and then there's a great promise that we read in the first psalm will be like that tree that grows by the stream and the, the leaf never fades it will bud and blossom and bear fruit to God's glory that would be our prayer for our children and for our young people that they would bud and blossom and bear fruit we see the buds coming out at this time of the year and we pray that we would see the buds blossoming in God's house and that we would see the foliage and the tree spreading out its branches and its leaves and that leaf will never fade if by faith and by faith alone we put our hand into God's hand bless this time of worship bless this word to us and bless our meeting and gathering your word reminds us not to neglect come together so we come here this night and we pray that it be a time of great blessing to god's glory may we all humbly acknowledge our need of our savior and how we pray that we would follow hard after thee that we would surrender to the lordship of christ and that we would say for me and for my house we're going to follow the Lord, no matter what else. Help us, strengthen us as we come in weakness. But amazingly, your word reminds us that when we are weak, then we are strong. And help us, Lord, to stand and to stand out from the crowd and to serve thee acceptably. Bless now all that is done here as we praise and as we pray and as we worship and as we read God's word the only rule to direct us when everything else is passing help us to hold on to this word continue with us now forgive us for all our many failings be with all whom we love where they are and we can silently and remember them some very far away Bless them, Lord, and protect them and draw them all to yourself. For we ask it all along with the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus, our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. So, friends, what's our vision for the future, for personally and for 
our church and for the nation. Well, we're going to sing, and it's a prayer to you, and we sing, Lord, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Mission praise number 51. going to read the scriptures but it's a little bit jumpy it's not going to be up on the screen it's going to be in, in sections and we're reading a familiar story first of all in first samuel chapter 17 uh, the story of david and goliath and rather than read the whole lot i'm just going to take sections of it and then we'll read a few verses in galatians <clears throat> so just follow it <coughs> pardon me uh, here we go from verse uh, four a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armour of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, 
we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And then the, the next portion is where David comes forth and uh, he presents himself as one who will go to, to battle. And then David said to Saul, Let Loman lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armour on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took a staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. And then verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day... The Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of, carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the head. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the floor. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. May God bless his word to us. And just a few verses from the book of Galatians in chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel, other than what you accepted. Let them be under God's curse. And finally, in chapter 3, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh. I trust that God will bring all these verses together as we preach it and as we share it in a few moments. And before that we do that, we'll sing some five verses from Psalm 40. I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear.
in order that one can reckon it, be to them declared. We were going to sing, but praise the Lord. Well, continuing the theme uh, that we had this morning, it says, follow the crowd or be true to yourself, part two. Now, if you haven't heard part one, well, I'm not sure what I should say. But this is separate, but it's the same theme in a di from a different perspective. And let me begin by saying, you and I, we've got to be true to yourself in all walks of life. Wouldn't you agree? You've got to be true to who you are. And to be true to who, who we are, we need to live fully as free men and free women. We cannot become somebody else. We cannot try and appear to be what is desired by others. We cannot change our ways so that we'll find acceptance with others, whether it's in our community, in our family, or anywhere else. We cannot change. Chameleons are known for their ability to change. They change color. According to their situation and circumstances, they change to blend in. So if, you, if they're in with the reds, they change to the red. If they're in with the blues, they become a blue. And people, there's a tendency and a capacity in humanity to try and blend in, like we're talking about today, and you heard it through Kenny's prayer, stand from the crowd. The crowd, this homogenous group, this grey group, you need to break free from it sometimes. And be your own colour. And might it be said that we too are liable to such change and that we may wish to blend in with people around us, at work in the community, there's this, this social pressure, this sense that we need to wear the same clothes, so to speak, to speak the same, talk the same talk, and, it, and in so doing, we find acceptance. But yet we become somebody different. We're not being true to ourselves. I remember many years ago, my father would always be well-dressed for his work. Suit, collar and tie, every day of the week, and the same to church on Sunday. But you know, when summer holidays came once a year, off to Aberdeen we would go. And the old man, and I say that respectfully, the old man would become a new man, a different man. The suit, the tie, all that was gone. And the brogues, you know, the classy brogues. On would come the light-coloured summer trousers, like chinos that we would have today, the polo shirts, the casual wear, even sandals. He became a different man, so different that... Even on sunny days, he would sit in and watch test cricket when England were playing at edge pass. And things like, things that he would never do at home. He just, you're away, he's somewhere different. Now, he wasn't trying to be different, but in a sense, he was blending in as a, a tourist, a visitor in a, on holiday. Just being like everybody else. There was nothing wrong in what he was doing. But I, I can, you can see, we do it ourselves. Oh, don't you? Can, off with the boiler suit, the wellies, and... <laughs> The hat, the straw hat, and you, you've done all that. We, we do it to an to extent. So, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But in the story here we have of David and Goliath, we see a, another aspect of change and outward appearance. And so, uh, young David, he's come into Saul's service. Saul is the king, the first appointed king of Israel. And they've been confronted with this great challenge of Goliath. Goliath come to threaten not just a small part, but the whole people of Israel. And he th throws down the, the gauntlet and says, well, let's have a battle with your best warrior. And if I win, we rule over you, and vice versa. Thinking that there was no one at all going to be in the, the camp of Israel who could overcome this, this man, this giant. But this young man was going armed with something different. And so... In the natural, Saul said to him, now go, take my tunic, here's my armour, here's my sword. He was giving, he was kind of enduing him with his authority, his, his stamp of approval. And that this in itself would, would bring him strength and uh, add to who he was. He put a coat of armour and a bronze helmet. He fastened it on David, gave him his sword. And now David said, now I'm clothed, ready to take on this giant and destroy him. No, he didn't. What he said was, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. He took all the extras that the king had put on him, that the king thought would be so important, but he took them all off, stripped right down to the bare essentials, his tunic, his sling, and off. This was him ready to, to go off to fight Goliath. No, 
to kill Goliath. He didn't go just to do battle. He had the eyes of faith. He knew that God had given him into his, into his hands and that the outcome was going to be that the giant was going to be killed. So he went with faith because God had equipped him with what he needed, which wasn't the armor, which wasn't the bodily externalities, but it was the, what God had, had armed him with. And in so doing, he fulfilled, he fulfilled God's calling on him to be the warrior for, for Israel. And I think we can see some parallels that apply to our own lives and our own personality and expression of faith. The faith we have is not passed down to us from our father or from our grandfather or from anyone else. It is not passed on and it doesn't become ours by inheritance. It's not someone else's persona. It's not someone else's armour. No matter how our parents loved us and prayed for us, they couldn't put spiritual armour on us. There you go, son, you're saved. No, we had to come to that place ourselves. We can learn the faith of our father and grandparents, but we have to come to a place where that faith becomes personal, where we put it on, we clothe ourselves afresh with Christ and the armour that he gives to us as an individual. Your grandfather, your, fa your father, your mother's faith is no good for you tonight. So if you're clothing yourself, anyone here or watching, if you're clothing yourself, well, my mother was a wonderful Christian. She prayed for me all her life. That's no good. It was good for her, but it serves no good for you unless you respond to the prayers of your mother and surrender, as we said in prayer, to the Lordship of Christ. And this is where God will equip you. We have to be ourselves. And we have to dispel the things that come upon us to try and conform you the rules and regulations of a community, of a culture. And this culture, we have a strong culture and norms and customs, things that are imposed upon us. We don't always, we're not always aware of them, but you don't have to dig too deep until you find some strong and rigid customs. And they, they can be a restriction on us. You have to conform in your village to the norm of your village and to your community. And if you don't, there are consequences. And so people do try to blend in with the crowd, the community. We speak like them, we act like them, we dress like them. We become one with them in that sense. But God doesn't want us to become one with them in our hearts, in our attitudes, as we were hearing today. We've got to be different. We've got to be radical and being as Christians. So we don't just accept what others put on upon us. We come to God with nothing. We come to God with no clothing that we can say, Lord, these, these are my garments that are impressive. They're nothing. As the hymn says, just as I am, I'm waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot. O Lamb of God, I come with nothing. I come with nothing before the Lord. And that's how God strips us down. Even as David stripped himself down from all the externalities, the, the armor was no good. He just was left with the bare essentials. That's what God does to our lives. And many a person has had to be stripped down in their pride and arrogance and their resistance to God. And they're, they're, They have the shield, but it's a shield that, that's trying to ward off the gospel. They're hearing the gospel. They're putting up the shield saying, no, I'm not going to yield yet. So God, we have to bring that shield down. You have to bring the shield of your own self-defense, whatever it is, and bring it down so that God will place his robes upon you. So people do have these barriers to God. Tonight the call is for everyone to lay down your arms. Lay down that which you think is worthy in God's sight. And also to lay down the things that are in your heart which you're saying Yes, 75% to Christ, but 25% you're still holding in reserve for some unfathomable reason. But God is beckoning to let it go and just to know that grace and peace that comes in to our hearts. Well, and another way that we look at ourselves, and again, it's part of our culture. We grew up with this, with this, I am a wretched worm, the least of all, the worst of all sinners. And we may have been bad sinners, but to, it's like wearing a badge. I'm so, so bad. I'm so bad and the things I've done. And God, and we sort of trying to, it, 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 it's false 
spiritual. It's a false pride. It's whatever it is, it's wrong and it's a block between you and God. You're no worse than the person sitting next to you. You're no worse than the person who's sitting in Berlin for the rest of his life because of the crimes he committed. You're no worse, but you're no better. Because we all have sinned, and whether it's a great or gross sin or a small sin, we still have that barrier between you and God. And so you have to bring down the, the shield that you're holding up again. And when people are in prison, they are left to they are left to face up with the consequences of their sin. Years and years in prison, they face up with the, the grossness of what they've done. It haunts them. And they only truly find peace, as we know from the many books and testimony. They only find peace when they come to God and he takes the burden of the guilt off them. And they have peace. They may have to spend the next 5, 10, 20 years in prison. But they have peace in their soul. And this is the great gift that God gives to us. And then he clothes us with that, the garments of salvation and the robes of righteousness. And we, we're just new people in him. And the old is gone. The new has come. We are, in fact, new creations in Christ Jesus. And, and then we are ready for a spiritual battle. Because the spiritual armor that Saul gave to to David, but the spiritual armor that God gives to you and I, we know it well from Ephesians 5. The shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, and your feet shod with the gospel of salvation. That's what God clothes us. He takes, put that on, son, put that on, daughter, this, and it fits you. There's one size and it fits us all. And it's, it's, it's a it's not a burdensome thing that comes upon us. And we say, thank you, Lord, clothe me in that, please, tonight. Yes, clothe me in that, that I can go out tomorrow and face life clothed with God's power, empowering, and I've left my own self-righteousness. Now, we, in our custom here, we do not have an altar call. But in many churches worldwide, they do have an altar call. And it, it's a one, it can be a wonderful place to leave burdens. And we see in the book of Acts that there was something like an altar call. People who were into witchcraft, into all kinds of weird, strange spiritual things, they would come forward and they would leave their, what was their, their voodoo dolls or whatever it would be in different cultures. And this was a sign that they were ridding themselves of these things that had dominated their life. But most of all, what we don't see is the sin, the burden that people come to the, come to the front and they would, on bended knee they give up what's in their heart and they rise up in newness of life and they go home in joy and this is the greatest joy of the gospel to preach is to see sinners coming to repent and here we pray that you're doing it in your own we won't as far as I'm, I can guess for the future we won't be calling people to the front you'd be, you'd be saying oh, we'd be mortified well, what we're calling you to do is to do it at home as if there was an altar in your home and you would just go to it as if you were before God and church and say, get down on your knees and say, Lord, I'm just releasing this burden of sin in my heart. And God will meet with you. And so that's the question that's been posed by the teaching tonight. Have you laid down your garments of self-righteousness even as David had to lay down his, which didn't appear? The armor that God gave him, it, it, it hindered him, it encumbered him in his life. And in this instance, you and I, we take up gladly the offer of the king. We heard about him this morning. The king of the Jews. He's the king of the Gentiles too. And just as we come to a king to receive his acceptance, and he reaches out his hand to bless us. And that's what he's here to do tonight and every time we gather. Now, in the book of Galatians, a few verses which I read, the Galatian church, in their early days, were being persuaded by certain groups to put on more than just the garments of Christ. They had come, they'd been saved, by grace they were saved, they knew that, but then they began to be drawn by other Jewish sects. Well, you can't just be, you have to add this, you have to, circumcision, you have to have diet, kosher, 
Jewish customs and you have to follow certain holy days in the year. And so they were adding, it's like Saul putting on to David, you have to put this bit of armor. If you're going to be a true Christian, you have to do this and you have to do that. And they were being persuaded by very persuasive people. And Paul inter in intercepted and said, absolutely no. Grace, grace, grace. Get rid of all these things. You won't please God by law, by customs, by ritual. You only please God through faith. Faith is what pleases God. And if you have faith in Christ, that's all God requires. That when we come to him, we believe that he exists and that he's the reward of those who diligently seek him. And that he gives us his peace. So Paul was opposed to that and so we should be in ourselves too. We should be opposed to that which we try to add to our lives. Like in my early Christian life, I thought it was the right thing to get dressed in a certain way. Like my father, collar and tie in the very... That was, that, that was the accepted norm. And if I'd come to church dressed otherwise, I would have been shunned in those days. That's a long, quite a long time ago. But that was, that was the way it was. And so you felt the pressure to, to be one of them. But after a while, that tie became rather restrictive. Now, I'm not looking at any of those wearing ties. I mean, ties are great, but it's the whole idea that you had to be. Ladies, and not that long ago, you had to wear a hat. I don't see many hats here tonight. I haven't seen for a while, but they're fine. Nothing wrong with them if you choose to. But the customs were that you had to be. And if you didn't have a head covering as a woman, well, what a disgrace. But see how customs, these were cultural customs, which... The interpretation of the scripture was this, that you had to be. And so look today, that custom has changed. God hasn't changed, his word hasn't changed. So we too shouldn't try and impress people with our religion by our, our, our externals. And it's easy to have Christian paraphernalia in our life and to dress like a Christian and to present ourselves to people as Christians and yet in their heart not be Christian. And so it's a vanity. It's, it's an utter vanity. Yes, get dressed up to the nines, if you will, but make sure that your heart is right with God. If it's not right with God, it's a show, it's a sham. And God sees through the sham of all our hearts. So it, again, just take the pressure off yourself. Be yourself. Stand out from the crowd and be true to yourself. Don't feel the, the, the social norm to be, to be yours. You don't have to adopt it. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. We'd rather have what God gives us in Christ and all the approval of our community. Yes, we would like our, our community's approval, but God's approval should come first for you, for I. Do we think like that week by week? When we step into our week, are we trying to be, as Paul said, are you men pleasers or are you God pleasers? What's the, what's the balance of your life at work, play at home socially are you trying to please appease the men and women that you mix with by blending in with them how about blending into the church fully how about blending fully into the church by integrating your heart as well as your body sitting here and online this is the great joining that must take place the words that we sang in Psalm 40 are so, so right for us here tonight. Oh, blessed is the man or the woman whose trust upon the Lord relies, respecting not the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. Our trust must be wholly and fully in the Lord. Our trust is fully in the Lord Jesus. And in doing so, we are blessed. And in not doing so, we miss the blessing. So we need to take heed to these spiritual matters and not try and impress and we don't toe the line of culture but we toe the line of God's word give me your heart lay down your burdens come to me so tonight let me ask you all here and watching are you first and foremost pleasing God in your life is that your highest Delight and joy, apart from pleasing your wife and husband. Are you pleasing God by the, by the attitude, disposition of your heart, by the actions of your life? 
Is it foremost in your mind tomorrow morning when you clock into work or whatever you do? God, I, I'm a God pleaser. I'm not a man pleaser. No matter what I encounter, encounter today, I'm going to ensure that my heart goes the God way and not the way of the crowd. Not the way of the gossip, not the way of tittle-tattle, not the way of unseemly reports, but the way of purity, the way of keeping myself pure in heart and mind and I in activity. And these are the ways that show that you have been renewed in your heart. Renewed by the Spirit of God with new desires. Cast off, we could say, cast off the smelly clothes of self-righteousness, the smelly clothes of our own worth before God. And let God clothe you afresh. And if you can do all that, then you will have a testimony to tell. You will have a living, vibrant testimony. You won't be coming along to a meeting to listen to somebody's testimony. You'll have a testimony to tell of how the Lord changed your hard, resistant, stubborn heart and made it compliant with his and gave you a new song. And that's what we're going to sing now. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for for me. Amen. thank you for this Sunday. Our church has been so wonderful to be here, to be with your people, to worship you in spirit and in truth. 
and to hear the gospel preached. And we pray, Lord, that by the power of your Spirit that you would apply to the hearts and minds of everyone who has attended here in person and online. To God be the glory. Now part us, Father, with a Father's blessing of peace, love and joy in and through your Holy Son, Christ. Amen.